And now, weighing in out of the blue corner, Josh the Pong Thompson. 100% agree. And on the other mic, he weighs in from the red corner, Big John McCarthy. Well, we are lucky enough now to have an MMA super fan, a guy who has been there, done that at the highest level possible. The guy who put Chuck Liddell on the video of Rockstar. That's when I started to go, we've made it. We've yeah. made it. That's what Michael, I <laughs> Michael Kroger of Nickelback. What's up, my friend? How you doing, bud? It's been Thank a while you. since I've seen you. A long time. I, I, uh, a big part of the reason why I agreed to do this podcast is because then I get to talk to you guys. You yeah, know? right. I don't see, I don't hardly see you anymore because I, 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 you know, the, I haven't been out to to any events uh, in in the last little while. Um, and uh, and and my friend that I used to come to the MMA events with, uh, sadly, we lost him. And and yes. um, so you know, we, we we were like an ongoing thing where you know, if there's an event, you know, one that you guys were usually at, uh, Bellator for a time there that. Um, you know, he would call me up and we would come and see you guys. And, you know, I, I've just been, I have been having more trouble getting away, but it, we've also been on tour for like, we were on tour for the last 18 months. So it's, uh, you know, now, now I'm finally home. So maybe I'll start making a nuisance myself wherever you guys are. <laughs> what's, uh, what's, uh, where are you, where are you call home now? Uh, Hollywood Hills, uh, Los Angeles. <clears throat> okay. Cause oh my I God, have you not, have you not figured out you're, I mean, you're from Canada. <laughs> You've seen the gorgeous lands of Alberta and everything. And you're in the Hollywood Hills. Yeah, man. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's um, <laughs> talking to both of you guys where you're at. I kind of understand, you know, what you're talking about. Cause you know, as you know, I do travel uh, for a living. So I get to see the world and, and, and mm -hmm. all of America. And, and there is uh, a lot of reality to that statement that, you know, um, just outside of LA is the world, you know, mm. it, it, this is a bubble unto itself, but yep. I've kind of been a, I've kind of been a person who lives in bubbles because, you know, we went from British Columbia, uh, originally, you know, first born in Alberta, then moved to British Columbia for about 15 years. And that's a bubble. And then I moved to Maui, Hawaii for 12 years. And that's a bubble. And now I'm in, in this bubble here. And, and, and none of those places are, um, are typical, you know, they're, they're odd and, and strange places that have, uh, uh, really well-defined positives and negatives. And, and so far, I mean, if it was that bad guys, I would leave, you know, so far, <laughs> you know, I'm still having a good time here. I just got done running the Hills with my dog and, and, um, you know, passing out smiles on the trail and, and, um, I, I'm still feeling a lot of good here in LA. You know, I, I, I <laughs> John, especially, I, I know you, you've, you've had some times in LA do, doing what you used to do. Just you, couple yeah you don't see necessarily the best of everybody every day you know doing yeah. you know working for the lapd it's whew, you know so i could see how you could get a, a negative opinion but uh um yeah so far so good and actually i'm running into a lot of lapd people uh, uh in a good way uh and um you know uh <laughs> we're having like positive interactions you know? positive uh, ones <laughs> not so much with the cuffs and the taser but yeah. uh, more sort of hey sir how you doing can i buy you a coffee and um and, and you know, I, i'm a big fan of, of law enforcement and, and and the guys and girls who work here are li quite literally under the gun you know but uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to support them you had you had um you were in canada and you moved to hawaii you said you're there for about 12 years how long ago did you sell because i just read an article you sold your property there and then when did you move to la um, I moved here in, geez, I should probably have that ready in notes before you ask me that. Um, <laughs> I think we've been here, we've been here. You don't have to be years. accurate. Don't eight, worry about eight, it. Seven, eight years. We, we left Hawaii seven, eight years ago. Okay. Really what it was about was, um, my children, uh, are, are sadly, uh, both musician artists and uh, I tried to talk them out of it, but they wouldn't listen. Of course, I like, tried to talk mine out of law enforcement. They yeah, didn't listen well, to me yeah, either. No, so yours, you got the same thing. You, you, yeah. you, 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 they, for whatever reason, they want to do it. The uh, last one they're going to listen to, man. Trust me. Yeah, they're not listening to us. <laughs> uh, but um, it, 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 so we moved here because uh, I wanted to put both my children through music school, uh, and and there's a really fantastic school here in in Hollywood. Not we can walk there from our house uh, called Musicians Institute, and it's basically like a uh, like a Navy SEAL level proving ground for music. You know, they they immerse them totally. All they do is eat, sleep music, eat, sleep music. Uh, it's total immersion in that culture so i wanted them to be here and my wife and i also have a, a custom jewelry business that you know it was nice enough to live in hawaii but you know 
people don't come to Hawaii to buy, you know, uh, couture jewelry, you know, yeah. diamonds and, and platinum and stuff. And, and I also I had to, uh, I wanted to finish my gemology degree. I'm a graduate gemologist with the okay. Gemological Institute of America, as well as, uh, my, my day job and all my other. Michael, um, I didn't know that you were so scientific. I, yeah. You're a geologist. <laughs> It's a little or a gemologist. Gemologist, yeah. yeah. Gemologist is like it's there is a touch of geology in there, but it's more about the study of the precious gems, you know, like the, the diamond, ruby, emerald, sapphire, and then all the rest uh, of the things, and and so that folds well into our business that we have here. What? So your kids? How old are they? If you don't mind, my son uh, is twenty three, and my daughter is twenty one. Okay, so they're um, older. I was I thought you were supplementing this school with real with re, not with regular school, like supplementing because there's there's academies all around Texas where uh -huh. they're like soccer academies where your kids do like two hours of school and then they mm -hmm. play soccer the rest of the mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And so there's like some you. football academies as well that it's football pretty much all day yeah. and there's like two or three hours of school and that's it. And then it's right. all football. So I wasn't sure that, if this I, is what it was. I, I like I like that model because it's more sort of um mission oriented, you know, mm -hmm. versus you know, if if your kid's gonna be a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist or whatever, shit, yeah, you know, get him in the program, right? Get you know, get him yeah. in the university, like you know, go for the the higher levels of that stuff. But my son, you know, we High school wasn't really where he was going to be, you know, like it, it, he was not going to be an academic. He's going to be a musician. We knew it all along. So we actually had him take his GED uh, uh, in uh, halfway through the ninth grade, the, pretty much the day after he turned 16 years old in Hawaii, you can test out. And, uh -huh. and he did test out right away, got his driver's license the next day. And then we moved to Hollywood <laughs> you know, the following week. And he went to a music school. We made him a deal that you know, hey, son, you don't have to go to high school. I can see it's not working. And it, it, there was other things that just, it just wasn't good for him. Uh, um, uh, but it was like, you're not going to just lay around. You know, you're not just going to sit around and eat Doritos and play PlayStation. So we uh, moved here to Los Angeles. And one day, I'll just tell you a quick story because I'm so proud of him on this one. Um, one day, uh, he got in an Uber car and split because he was hanging around with his friends that way. And uh about two hours later, I got a call for, hello, this is Musicians Institute. Is this Michael? Yeah. Uh, your son's here. And um, he uh, he's finished his interview and he's uh, finished his application and um, he did his audition and uh, he's cleared to uh, enroll. He And I was like, I said, excuse me, did my son just enroll himself in college without <laughs> talking to me? And she was like, yeah. Um, right. He just wants to know if he can forge your signature and will you pay? Like, <laughs> uh, uh, yes and yes. Uh, so, he, you know, my son's a bit of a go-getter. My daughter That's is it. very much of a, of a similar sort of um, uh, uh, personality mentality to the, they're both uh, complete beasts, uh, monsters. Uh, I'm not worried about them anymore. They're at that age yeah. uh, that um, I know they're going to figure it out, whatever. You know, whatever they choose to do, I know they're going to do it uh, with distinction, and 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 they're they're going to win. When did you notice that that they that they were they were they were the go getters that they were the monsters they were the active, trying to be forward looking? It, you well, it, you see it early. You see flashes of it early. You know, yeah. you know the, um, when they when they take the initiative on something they want to do. Like seven, uh, eight. And, Are we talking four or five? Yeah, seven, well, eight? maybe earlier. Like yeah. my my daughter could have had a career in mixed martial arts the way she was in in um, grade school. I'll tell you, but uh, <laughs> it, you know, she just didn't really. When when the boys when the boys would give her a hard time and push her around, she would uh, kick push back. Out of them, you know, yeah, I got, got a to got a girl four times, and you know, and, and uh, yeah, you know, because I get called to the school, it's like, oh, you know, your daughter's in trouble. Yeah, you got to come in, you know, and so we go in the office, and you know, and I'd hear the rundown, you know, I'd hear mm -hmm. the like the 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 what do you call it, like the charges, you know, they'd run through the charges of her transgressions, and I'd just be like, okay. sounds pretty good to me, yeah. like, uh, <laughs> good one, good one. Hey, yeah. and, you know, in the school, people are like, come on, we're gonna go That's shopping. Cool. You did good. <laughs> Yeah. You don't, you don't teach her to push kids down and bite them. And I was like, yeah, but they were picking on her. You know, yeah. they, they, oh, that's no, exactly no. what you do. Yeah, I, yes. Don't start <laughs> you it. Just don't let someone ended. pick on you. I'm sorry. You don't let them. Pick no, on and 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 that's um yes. So yeah, the, she 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 decided to go into music though. She's 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 not a formal formally trained fighter. Let's say. <laughs> 
and my son, I had him on the mat in jujitsu on Maui when he was very, very young. And, and he did it. He, he indulged me for about a year and a half or two years and yeah. uh, got deep into white belt territory. And then, um, he, he just, it just doesn't, he doesn't feel it, you know? So, uh, it's, that's okay. No, it's not yeah. for everybody, right? It's Looney Tunes. Well, Josh, if you're into sports and you are a guy that likes MMA, football, baseball, basketball, you're probably a guy that likes to bet on those sports. And BetUS is the way to do it. Right now, if you go to BetUS and use our code YouTube150, you will get an incredible 150% above what you put down. And the second time, if you put more money, 125%. BetUS is the way to go. We do give our odds. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're not. I'll be <laughs> honest. But we do give our odds for BetUS, and they are absolutely a fantastic betting site. John, that's why they call it betting, buddy. We're, we're betting on ourselves to win. That's what I'm Love betting that. on myself to do. So, Ooh. look, we, we really enjoyed using their odds over there, and they've actually come out with some early odds that, they, that we had talked about for the, um, for the newest pay-per-view that is coming up. And that's going to be a fantastic one. So make sure you guys tune in, head over to BetUS, use the use YouTube 150, get 150% bonus on your first deposit. On your next two deposits, you get 125% bonus. So guys, look up, head up, head over to BetUS and use our promo code YouTube 150. 90% nah, you, don't get past blue belt. They get the blue belt and then they stop. But I always say there's three types of kids. You know, when, especially when it comes to doing the martial arts, you'll get the <laughs> You'll get the first type that I say is a, it's about 15% is they like contact. They mm. like pressure. They like mm. to actually engage with someone, grab a hold of them and see if they can get the best. And it doesn't matter if they're getting, you know, someone's, you know, getting to them that they just want to know, how do I get, how do I get back? Right. <laughs> and, then, and they're about 15%. Then you get a group that's probably about eh, somewhere in the 50 to 55% that they're not born with the ability to say, I like contact but they can be taught that it's okay and they become comfortable with it and they can do it. Right. And then you'll get that 30% or so that they're never going to like it. It's yeah. just not who they are. Everything yeah. else is, you know, more important to them. And it's just like, eh, I just don't like it. And it's, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? They, they, it's, it's still in them, you know, cause as, yeah. as you guys know, when you, when you train that, it goes into your DNA, I think. And you know, every once in a while his, his band guys will start wrestling around and, <laughs> it's he's still yeah there's, oh, there's still it's, remember a, it's a life skill it's a life oh, skill yeah, you can take is. with you forever it's, i've, I've couldn't like even though my son he wrestles a little bit we do one day a week in wrestling we do one day a week in jiu-jitsu mixed in with some other sports yeah. but it's it's a life skill and i've made it very very obvious to him like hey you can't allow other kids to push you around because once you do they're going to continue to do it every single day the kid yeah. that you allow to take your lunch money one day he'll come back yeah. for it on day two day three day four you know, it's yeah, like he's not he going to forget about you because he knows he can. And so yeah. I'm not teaching him how to fight, but you're teaching him how to stick up for themselves. Like, hey, no, I don't have to do that. You know, and there'll be some bumps and bruises along the ways. But like I said, it is a life skill that you can take with you forever. And it's so great when I see people that are in their 60s, 70s, still training jiu-jitsu. I'm like, this is awesome. This is yeah. awesome because, I mean, I'm getting closer. And so it's, it's, <laughs> it's brutal. It's brutal. You know, you don't, I don't, I don't, I wake up every morning with the, uh, uh, but you know you still want to go do it you know and maybe you take a couple of days off you know in between the sessions yeah. but that's it. you know but I, it's a I life skill. actually with a guy um I, I i drop in on schools a lot uh mm -hmm. when i'm on tour and um uh uh carlson gracie jr is a good friend of mine mm -hmm. and so i dropped into his hq in chicago and um uh he was he was he was away you know they're always away doing yeah. you know sem seminars and and you know working on their things and uh, but he connected me and i got in there and i trained with the guy my training partner that day um is a retired chicago pd uh and when he retired from chicago pd he uh he was 60 and he walked into the carlson gracie school at 60 he started to train guy's 78 years old he's a he's a like a two-stripe black belt and he, he, he's still like <laughs> yeah you know it, it doesn't we don't have to stop this and that, that <laughs> no. you know that that made me feel great you know because he and you know he, he's giving me the thing where it's like oh you must lift weights like every day and i'm like what and he's yeah. like oh you're so strong and i'm like mm. 
yeah. I know what this means. <laughs> yes, I could be a little bit more focused and my technique could be better. Yes. It's yeah, his way of saying that, you know, hey, you're yeah. strong, but I, yeah. I have technique. Yes. You're not I very good. <laughs> It's funny because, you know, Eric is the, the guy who introduced both you and me. Yep. And uh, Eric, I met Eric at my gym. He was there to shoot a commercial and it was a yep. commercial for someone else. And he was one of the the people that was going to be not, not only in it, but doing a part with it. And he just was, he was a different guy, but he was so kind. And he says, Hey, I, I would really like to work out. And I thought he meant work out as far as role and stuff, but no, he wanted to work out as far as weights. But it was it was hysterical because he started getting very interested in, you know, the martial arts and how to how you, well, why does this work? And so I said, well, come on, and I started rolling with him, and I and I said, just you know, get you know, go ahead and you know, do whatever you want to me, and I'll try to turn you over, right? And so I get on top of him, right? And he's like, and I'm you know doing things by him, and he's like, he goes, he says, yeah, he goes, oh my god, he says, I can't believe how easy that was. And he goes, he says, but you know, I think that I could push. I said. Hold on a second. So I bring a guy that's a 135 pound world champion, though, but he's 135 pounds. And I bring him over. I said, "Okay, you can push on." I said, "Brian, go go with him." And you know, Brian fucking you know tapped yeah. him out about five times in about two yeah. minutes, right? And it was yeah. like he was like, "I just don't understand this stuff at all." Yeah. And I go, "Yeah, this is the way." I say, "Look, when you don't know it, it works." Yeah. beautifully it's you, yes. get, you have to you have to know what you're doing to counter yeah. somebody else that knows what they're doing yeah if and, you and, don't and you're a lost duck man i tried so hard to get him on on the mat oh uh, my god he had, I, I think i ruined him yeah, i do you, i think you, i think i ruined him that wow. rope with john's over here taking pride in that no yeah. no no i'm not <laughs> john's like yeah terrible. i'm the guy that ruined that no. guy that's right yeah. he never <laughs> wants to trade again made him respect the art you know it is it's a it's a fine line, you know. You remember those Gracie challenge stories where the guys come in and they, they I think I'm a tough guy, you know, and they yeah. get humbled and then they become a lifelong student. It, it, you know, it, it, getting humbled has different effects on different people. I know I love it. You know, I get yep. humbled on a daily basis in there, and then it's um it, it's one of my favorite places to be. How long have you been training? Uh, I first stepped on the mat on Maui uh, probably like 18 years ago. So I've been, I've been going for a while. I'm on and off, uh, more off than on just because of my work schedule and, and my uh, injury schedule, <laughs> which is what's keeping me off the mat right now. I, I got a funny uh, torn uh, tendon thing in my elbow from, I'm sure it's not from jujitsu. It's from playing bass for sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Sure. Being a ba dude, that for fucking sure. motion being a bassist, dude. It'll, it'll very, dangerous. Every time. very dangerous. Very yeah. dangerous. I, <laughs> I should just stick to the mat sports. So, okay, yeah. so should I ask what belt? A purple belt. A purple belt. Okay, so 12 years Twelve years ago, you stepped on it. Purple belt now. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. It's 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 been a while. I, I can't even remember when I really started, but... Um, yeah, it, it, it's it, it, when I get off tour is when I can really focus on it because when I'm on tour, I, 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 I don't do any live roles when I'm on tour and you know, how important that yeah. is, you know, but I just work technique only, uh, when I'm on tour because like, I can't, can't get, to get busted hurt. up and then, you know, go to the gig and tell everybody to go home. <laughs> yeah. It, it might not be popular, you know, so yeah. I, I, I can still train, but I'm just very careful about how I do it. And, yeah. and it's, it's funny because some of the schools I drop in on that, um, you know, our like MMA schools, uh, you know, TriStar in, in, in yeah. Montreal. I went in there and and uh, learned some deep stuff from for us. Fuck, fantastic day. But when it came time for the sparring, you know, and I'm like, ah, you know, I'm starting to take my you know gear off and, sh and relax. And these guys are like, you know, these these killers. They're just like, yeah. hey, come on, let's roll around. You know, they look at me and they're like, yeah, this guy's probably an MMA guy. I should roll this. You know, I'm going to sharpen my teeth on the old man and, and, uh, you know, and I have to have this conversation. I had this conversation with a guy on the mat at TriStar while I was like getting ready to leave. You know, he's like, he's like, what do you want? You don't want to roll. And I was like, no, you know, like, he goes, come on, man. Come on. You know, like, come on. We'll go light. And I'm like, I've been yeah, doing this long enough. I know what that means. Like, don't. Yeah. It's, no. Yeah. There's I know a, there's, what going light means. That I simple word. No. I, Yes, no. it's my favorite N-word of all. But, uh, <laughs> they, um, you know, and the guy goes, come on, come on. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal right now. Right here, we'll make a deal. You go in the change room, bring your checkbook. You write me a check for $5 million. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to cash it. And then I'm going to come back and you can just twist my neck off or whatever you want. You know, yeah. we can just, but I was like, otherwise, no deal. And he's no like, deal. 
you sound committed. And I was like, you're getting the idea. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess let me, let me, let me go way back. How, how did you get involved in the sport? And then, you know, obviously having Chuck Liddell in your guys' video, what, how did that all come about? I, I remember way back, you know, way back when um, I was watching guys like Jeremy Horn. Uh, now you bring it up, Jeremy. I uh, love it. He was my favorite. Gumby. Dude. He, ha he hated that name. I, I don't doubt it. <laughs> I, just, I just remember watching guys like that, the gritty guys in the beginning when they're, when it was still human cockfighting and stuff. And um, uh I, I remember watching these guys train and having no one I watching them fight that is and what have no idea what was going on, but I just loved it. I, I love the commitment level. And I also gotta say, I talking about Jeremy Horn, I'm not gonna fanboy too hard, but he's he is one of my favorites of all time for sure. Uh I remember he would fight like a three round fight, and then as soon as the whistle would go off, the bell would go off, he would start doing push ups. Yeah. Just to prove that he had more gas in the tank, yeah. and then the other guy would do push-ups, and then he'd do more push-ups, and I was just like, I love this guy. He, you know, he not only did he beat the dude, he showed he's had more conditioning too. You know, just and he had man. that body style that didn't look like he was in shape. If I saw him on the street, I would just he'd be somebody that I would just, hey, I could beat that guy up. But, <laughs> and you talk to him, and he, you just realize he's so confident in his skills. And yeah. such a great guy too. And, Never looking to fight. He just and so talented. Extremely so talented. talented. So durable too. Like, yep. I mean, he dude, exploded on know. the scene with it, when he was able to take Frank Shamrock pretty much what into extra what the extra round. Oh, right? dude, he had Frank in deep. Yeah, Frank is a big. Trouble. That was the the first time I ever stood someone up from Mount was Jeremy Horn against Frank Shamrock, and I was like, wow. I'm I'm standing there because they had gotten into this whole thing about hey, we we want you know the fights to be. You know, action back if they're if they're just on the ground, they're not doing anything. And so Jeremy gets to a mount position on Frank and he just bases out. He just bases out, right? Oh. And I'm like, you and know, he didn't okay. let him up. And I'm and I'm and I'm sitting, and, and Frank is just sitting there holding on, right? And so they're yeah. they're just both doing nothing. I'm I said, Jeremy, yeah. right. you gotta do something, right? And he would take a hand and he'd start to move it like he was gonna, you know, use it as his forearm across the neck, and also yeah. boom, right back out to exactly where it was. Yeah. And it just kept happening. And it probably for about a minute and a half, I'm saying, Jeremy, if you don't do something, I'm going to stand you up, right? Finally, I stand him up, right? And he ends up losing. He goes for, they go for it, gets the takedown and gets behind Frank and he, they kind of fall back and Frank does a knee bar. Yeah. And I go in the back and I'm, I'm like, Jeremy, did you not hear what I was saying? He goes, he looks at me, he goes, yeah, John. He says, I, I, I heard exactly what you were saying. I said, then what were you thinking? Right, he, he actually he looks at me. He goes, he says, "I was thinking I am mounted on top of Frank Shamrock, and I don't want him to get anything on me." <laughs> and I go, and hopefully, there's a lot of people okay. taking pictures and video of this. Yeah, <laughs> you want to have that. Yeah, I was like, dude, he's he's one of the, the greatest guys ever. You know that he's had, you know that, that his record probably shows close to 100 fights. He's had at least 150 fights. Dude, that, that, that's the other thing, right? Is the, crazy. Is, the, is the amount of activity that he had in his record when i was first coming onto the scene and seeing these guys and you know guys like vanderlei silva and, and chuck and mm -hmm. you know all these other murderers that you know were coming up in the beginning that just impressed the hell out of me like pride and stuff was just totally awesome how, how did the relationship develop for you guys to get chuck onto your video rockstar i had i had met chuck before um uh, I, I got introduced to Chuck sort of coincidentally because I, you know how you become friends with somebody and you can't remember how yeah. it happened? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's true. It, yeah. <laughs> Josh Koscheck is my friend and I, for the life of me, Holy I cannot remember. Holy shit. So I cannot remember how we became friends, but we did. And, and, yeah. uh, and the one time, um, he came to our show in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. uh, he brought Chuck with him and, uh, oh, you know, uh, no, I, I, I do remember now how, how it worked. I, knew a guy oh my goodness um a, a fellow named clint for for a minute clint uh doll and he invited me upstairs to a suite where hendo chuck uh all of these guys were and yeah. josh um and and i met uh duane zinking yes and, so du um, duane used to be my manager with those okay, guys i was right. one of the first guys that duane used to manage with chuck okay there you have it so it was i got in, in, introduced to that team 
there. You know, I, I, I was standing around in a casino floor and, you know, Dwayne was like, I'm going to send Hendo to come get you. And I was like, oh. I, yeah. <laughs> Dan Henderson's going to come get me. Like, yeah. Okay. You know, that's, but then I went upstairs and it was just really fun group of guys. And, and, um, and that was the, the day that I met Chuck and, and, uh, we just hit it off as friends and, and, you know, when it was time to, to try to find, People for the Rockstar video, you, you can tell watching that video what a diverse cast we yes. were, you know, putting together. It was a really wide net, and and I was just I was really happy that, that Chuck agreed to do it. You know, it was really. I nice. would have been a little bit more concerned if Zinka would have been like, "Hey, I'm going to send Diddy to go get you." I'd be okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was Hendo, so it's a, it's cool. Man. I get it, but you know, <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, is that is that a too soon, Josh? It, that's a no, below the belt. It's, it's below the belt. <laughs> that's a below the belt. I, I don't know, it might be a too soon. Maybe a little too soon. Who knows? So I don't even I, think we know that the uh, the full depth of that um, uh, yeah. story. Yeah, I don't think I don't we want to know do. the full depth. I'm not sure anybody wants to know either. I just let's just man. <laughs> I got but, a bad um, enough uh, imagination. I, I don't know. No, no, no. When, when you guys start doing your music videos, I mean, who comes up with these plans on like how it's going to be laid out? Is it your guys' company? Is it you guys? Are, you have a direction on what you want to do? Because I always wonder. Sometimes the music videos are not. I'm like this. What, what is this? Doesn't make any sense. Not yours. I'm saying, but in general, sometimes they're like, "This is so far off." What What is this about? And then there's times where it goes exactly along with the song, right? Um, so we for a long time um, used to write our own video uh, concepts. You know, we would storyboard them ourselves. We would come up with the you know what the song's about, and then try to make you know a little mini movie to go with it. And that was you know, especially in the beginning when we really started to break through and the, the budget was um, <clears throat> not an issue. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I have I do have some regrets about this because we spent uh, fortunes on single videos. Um, so we would do these these um, these mini movies, you know, and they would be really elaborate and expensive as shit. And then um, what happened was this Rockstar wasn't really we didn't really think that um rockstar was gonna be what it became you know oh, so we, you were wrong yeah uh -huh. <laughs> very wrong dude um, i'll tell and, you that that song fucking blew up it did and and it was really you know it was i think the seventh single from that album all the right reasons and it was what I like to call the Aloha single when you, you know, you got all your, you've done all your work and then you just throw one out there to kind of like play out the clock while you get in the studio and go in and make the new record and stuff. Mm. And it rockstar was the Aloha single, except that somebody on our team, I think our manager probably, or maybe it was somebody at our record label in the UK hired this publicist guy who was determined to make it a hit in the UK. And he, he learned from the school of, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you guys, do you guys know the story of Alice, how Alice Cooper basically uh, became famous? Like the story of the, of the, um, like the billboard truck in yep. Piccadilly Circus that had a picture each side of, of Alice uh, on it. And he was fully naked just with a boa constrictor. And, and they yep. took the, the poster truck and basically disabled the engine in Piccadilly Circus and snarled traffic. And then it became this, oh, my God, look at this. It's, it's Satan, blah, 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 blah. You know, it turns out UK just loves when things get banned. You know, yeah. when things get banned, people just can't get enough of it there. And, and um, so I, I, it seems like our person learned from that school and what he did was he created these you know from the video which we decided we didn't want to be in at all we were on tour so mm -hmm. that's why there's just at the end of the video there's like a second of me and chad and that's it that's the only part we're in the video because we just weren't around we couldn't do it and there's a scene in the video where there's the um the the uh the, the girls from the playboy mansion where yes. In, and they took Josh, that Josh knows that scene well. I've been there a couple <laughs> times. Yeah, <laughs> you, great, you great place to hang out. You know, no, no um, Diddy party, but it's definitely nice to go. Oh boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, you, right, I, I, just so many things I could say right now. Um, but uh, they took that a still from that and they put it up on um, a poster, 
And then they told everybody that the video and the poster were banned in the UK for being too explicit. Mm. And then the single went to number one. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> in the UK. Yeah. And it was like struggling. It wasn't really, but it, but it popped because everybody was so uh, outraged that uh, they just had to hear it and had to see it. And uh, uh, the guy played the Jedi mind trick on the entire populace and it worked really great. And, and then we were on tour, I think in like Australia or something like that. And it was like, Hey guys, your single just went number one in UK. And we we're like, what? Wow. What, the, what are you talking about? We're, we're finished. The, the, we were about to finish our tour and, and and actually we were going into the studio to record and we had to cancel some of the recording to go and play a uk tour because the single had popped so hard wow. um so it but but it was it was one of those things that nobody saw coming there's another song on that record called um animals that uh you know we had done what we thought we were in the studio and we thought that the album was finished and for what you know i don't know what the hell happened but somebody said hey we need one more song and we're like, oh, okay, okay. We have to get on the plane and fly to a tour date tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So we need one song and we don't have it. Um, okay. So uh, the, the, you know, Chad wrote like a guitar riff. And, and then he took that guitar riff and then he went and sat in his car. And he wrote all the lyrics for Animals in 45 Minutes. <laughs> and then came in, we recorded the whole damn thing in like two, three hours. Wow. Uh, and then grabbed our bags and got the plane. <laughs> and that, this is the, uh, the story of animals is, is the, the, that's the fastest song we've ever, there's, there's a song on that record called saving me it took eight months, <laughs> eight months to write and record. And, and animals took 45 minutes to write all the lyrics and, and like four hours total to, Jeez. Right, of course. <laughs> so yeah, these, these, these spontaneity has a thing, you know, and and that's that video for Rockstar is is that where it was just like, oh, what happens if we just get all these people to sing the lyrics? Some of them are famous, some of them are, are normal people, and, and and we send them around the world too. Th those yeah. those people are from everywhere, you know. We we just sent a crew around the world because we were on tour, we couldn't do it. Josh, I don't know if you know this, but there is an incredible product out there called Element, and I'm not talking E L, I'm talking L M N T. Element, one of the greatest drinks that you could have, especially if you are a runner, you're someone that's out hiking, rucking, which is a big thing right now, or if you're farming like me when it's really hot, I am telling you right now, Element is the drink that you want to have by your side. It is fantastic. It is loaded with sodium because your body needs sodium. Sodium is how it runs. It also has electrolytes and magnesium other things that your body magnesium is one of the most important things that you can put into it tell me right now you're loving your element i love it i love the new watermelon flavor they just came out with it's fantastic you know it's funny when we were younger right they used to say if you eat too many eggs right you're, you'll have high cholesterol oh yeah all the lies yeah and now now they're saying that eggs is one of the leading nutrients basically for kids development in their brain same thing with salt for me right my career was kind of taking a little bit of a downturn because i wasn't drinking enough water and i wasn't able to actually keep the water in me and so i noticed that my body was wasn't able to maintain two three training sessions a day so i went to the doctor i did a hydration test they're like man you're so depleted of water you're dehydrated they said so i had to start salt loading well element wasn't around back then so I basically had to take really crappy salt and put it into my body. Man. Now that they have learned that there is different level, I have learned there's levels to salt. They feature some of the most premium salt in Element. So if you guys can check them out, man, they've got a thousand milligrams of sodium, two hundred milligrams of potassium, sixty milligrams of magnesium, and they've got different flavors. They've got the grapefruit, they've got the raspberry, they've got the watermelon, citrus, black, uh, black got the cherry, citrus lime, flavor. citrus. Yeah. They've got all different types of flavors and I enjoy them. And it's look, they come in a can so you can just grab them on the go or they come in little mix packets as well. So That's something nice. you can just grab the mix packet, buy a bottle of water or bring a bottle of water with you if you're not ready to have it right then. And you can just mix it yourself. I also, this is the sparkling, which comes in the can. I love it. It's fantastic. It's quick on the go. Also too, my kids use this. So my kids, like my son, he's very competitive in sports. And so what I do is I'll pack one of these into his lacrosse bag or into his soccer bag and he'll just have it available to him. Now, I will say this. One little caveat is make sure it's cold. Oh, yeah. It is a lot more enjoyable when it is cold. Don't get me wrong. I can drink it when it's not. But let me just tell you, it's like cracking open a nice cold beer. It's, that's what it tastes like when it's cold. You crack it open, boom, put it down. 
It's fantastic. So it's something I can get on the go. So check it out, Element. Use the link in the descriptions down below. Every purchase you guys get through our link down below, they will actually send you a bonus package of uh, products free product. or whatever. Yeah, free products. So check that out down below. I want to thank you guys for continuing to support us. Stay salty, my friends. That reminds me a little bit of like when you say sometimes under pressure, you know, you can pr produce something great. And fighters, sometimes they take fights on short notice. Yeah. And they have some of their best performances, you know, in a right. five in a five day, 10 day, because there's no stress really that comes along with it. Sure, yeah. it sucks. You're going to go out there and get punched in the face. That's what we've been doing pretty much our whole life. So there's that. Is, yeah. for, for your brother to sit in the car for 45 minutes, just immersed in what? And you know, punch it out. One song. Mm -hmm. And what? Doing? He's punching it out, man. He's punching yeah, it out. Punching lyrics. out. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, and then coming in and if you guys all to work as a unit to get it done in a couple hours. Right. Yeah, well, it, and, and it's yeah, there, there's another fight sort of parallel, which is like you get the you know, the career grappler in there, and and then for whatever reason, he just decides to throw hands and he gloves a dude and knocks him out. And it's like, whoa. Yeah, that's yeah. what he'll you know, do from now nobody on nobody now. Saw because that one coming and it's like, that, yeah, maybe you as, just take a shot. As soon as he does that, his grappling career is over because now he's a knockout <laughs> artist. But he gets paid, and, and then he has to knock out everybody. Yeah. And he ends up getting scorched. <laughs> well, there's one guy that everyone kept saying didn't have stand up, stand up, which was Habib. And then he drops Connor, and then oh, he yeah. you know, jumps on him. But his his mo was always just to wrestle, yeah, and control, yeah, 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 yeah. and do yeah. damage from the top yep. and ground and pound you out. It, it, it's not. It doesn't times. sell a lot of tickets, but damn, is that effective? Holy! You know, <laughs> it doesn't. It, just, it doesn't. It sell it sell tickets in his case just. Just because of the such dominant win he had it's over such Connor. dominant, such yeah. dominant performance. But yeah, like, and then yeah, to to glove, you know, to glove yeah. him was was pretty cool. But yeah, like watching a guy basically miss a shot at the hips, miss a shot at the leg, miss a shot at the knee, miss a shot at the lower leg. He gets basically the cup of the ankle. Yeah, and then he just climbs the body. You know, de just deconstructs a guy. Cain Velasquez and, and then was the same exactly. Eventually, just way. grinds him into the mat. It's yeah, yeah. So Cain Velasquez was the same way the second time he mm -hmm. fought Junior Dos Santos. It was the same thing. He was shooting low level ankle picks because he didn't want to get hit and knocked out. Right. So right. he was just chasing after him, chasing after him. And then you'd eventually just get tired from running, from trying yeah. to defend <laughs> takedowns. And when I finally get a hold of you, buddy, you're going for a ride. It's going to be bad. Yeah. Kane's a friend, too. Obviously, oh, that whole AKA guy. family. And, yeah. and I, I met Kane a couple times and I, I just loved him. I thought he was a great dude. And he's and an amazing the, person. Well, yeah, really, really great person, and and um and and the one thing that I remember Dwayne uh, would tell me about about uh, about Kane is like he said he goes I don't know what it is some genetic thing you probably know about this Josh it's like he never gets tired no, like he, he can go and go and go and go and go and nobody can keep up with him That's, and he just keeps going you know He's never when tired. you when you you go across the board with heavyweights the one thing that they're all deathly afraid of is getting tired getting exhausted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's the one thing that scared them to death about kane it wasn't his you know yeah he can wrestle you know his stand-up is okay he's got kicks he's got good hands but nothing special but they knew that if they couldn't get rid of him within yeah. a specific amount of time right uh, uh oh that train is going to keep on coming and i'm yep. going to start going downhill so it, he was a special breed at heavyweight you don't see a lot of them that are made like no. he was put together he, no, he's yeah. a special fighter Daniel Cormier would talk about how, you know, when they were wrestling in college, they were kind of around the same era. And he just talked about, man, they knew that Kane had a motor and he would just keep on, he'd be still be pushing the last two to three seconds of the third round in wrestling, just grinding, hanging on the head, shooting shots. He could be up by 10. He didn't yeah. care. He was still just grinding, he didn't change anything. <laughs> That's the way he fought. It, it didn't yeah. matter if he was dominating you. He was always trying to get you out of there. He was always trying. He was never comfortable just sitting back. Mm -hmm. and he, if you remember that fight he had against Ben Rothwell, because Ben is a giant human yes. being, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. He cuts mm -hmm. weight to 265, he's 285, he's 280, 285 when he when he's walks in the cage. Oof. And Ben Ben could fight. He could hit. Yeah. Kane yeah, yeah, took, yeah. That's a skill fighter. Yeah. Kane took him down. I don't know how many times in the fight. And Ben kept working his way to get back to the feet and boom, Matt returned. Boom, Matt returned. Boom, Matt returned. He's looking at you. That go, is demoralizing, man. Like, oh, my God. You just looked and you went, yeah. here's a guy, yeah. looks like he's half the size of this guy and just continues to put him on his butt. And it was like, after a while, you could just look at Ben Rothwell and you could see the, I don't know what to do.
What am I, I doing in I, here? Yeah. I can't I can't get this Velcro hound off of me. Yeah, you yeah. see you see the guys every once in a while in the in the ring or the octagon or whatever you call it, you know, wherever the, the arena is, where they just run into somebody like you know, yeah. in his heyday, uh, like Clay Guida, where you just see yeah. people in there with him, just they're like, "What the, what the fuck's happening to me? Yeah. Like, what, what is this? I'm fighting against like a Cuisinart here." <laughs> this he is he was to me a smaller version of I don't want to say Cain Velasquez, but he just reminded me with the motor that he had, sure. how yeah. Cain would fight. Yeah. He would yeah. come forward. Striking wasn't great. I mean, I fought him in his first big show, and he beat me because of that. And, you know, like he just yeah. had a motor on him, just yeah. kept coming forward, kept wrestling, kept wrestling. I was like, man. Yeah. Get this little leech off of me, man. He couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get him off of me. It's spectacular, it, man. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It is. It is. And I always prided myself on conditioning and, and cardio. But in that fight, man, he just had a better a better gas tank, and he applied it a lot better. He, and I, I, it's funny. It was years later, uh, probably just about two years ago, I ran into him in San Jose. He was at an event. And I owe a lot of what my career developed after that because of him. Because I was like, man, this guy was not on my level. He shouldn't have beat me. But he had the gas tank. And from then on, I made sure I was never out of shape. Never. Yeah. I just always yeah. stayed in shape the best I possibly could and became a better fighter because of it. Guys like that will either make you or break you. And it was it was very humbling to walk out of that cage going, shit, man, I lost to a guy who outworked me. That right. that it that breaks you not mentally. For me, it didn't break me mentally, but frustrated me like, man, you know you can do this. What mm-hmm. like you cut corners, you do this, whatever mm-hmm. it was. Mm-hmm. But man, he had a gas tank and he's a fantastic fighter. Still doing yeah. it, man. Just signed another fight. I know. I He's know. fighting yeah. in a couple weeks. Freaking nuts. Tremendous. Well, Still is. hardly touches the mat. Like the guy is yeah. hardly on the ground. He's airborne more than he's <laughs> yeah. touching. The, like <laughs> yeah, he's and, just and that, going and going. That, that conditioning element. Like one of my favorite jujitsu coaches that I go and see away from home because I I train with Hegan Machado here, yeah. and I train at the Henzo Gracie School in Los Angeles. Here Hold well. it. You you can get Hegan to actually put the video games down. You can, <laughs> What he he uh he he does teach sometimes. He, yeah, he, he, he's the thing about Hegan is like he doesn't look like he's paying attention, but oh, yeah. he doesn't miss anything. Yeah, he doesn't. Coaches miss always anything. have eyes in the back of their head. We know yeah. our students well enough when we're coaching yeah. them. Hey. He, he he know and and when you don't see him watching, he's watching. Yeah, he, he, the guy's instincts are fantastic. But the guy I was going to talk about, those guys are obviously you know Hegan and Henzo are, are my dear friends. They're brothers to me. I love these guys. Uh, but one of my favorite coaches is a guy actually in Canada, in British Columbia, named Marcus Suarez. He was one of the originals that came up from Carlson Gracie School yep. in Rio. And um, he taught with Hegan down there. And, you know, he's the only coral belt in Canada, to my knowledge. Uh, eight stripes on the coral belt. Like, mm. dude's a T-Rex. He, I remember he came to Maui once because I was, I was in the Carlson Gracie School on Maui. And I remember he came over to do a seminar once. Um, Marcus came and I remember seeing him and he, again, like you were just saying about an unassuming character, you see this guy and he's like, oh, fuck, I just saw like a hundred of those guys at Costco, you know, (laughs) except at Walmart, (laughs) a little different inside, you know, but, uh, he, he, his, the Marcus Suarez warm up is something that, um, nobody does anymore. It's the old school, old school Rio type warm up where nobody makes it. Yeah. Nobody, nobody gets all the reps in. At the end, everybody's laying on the mat. I make a puddle in front of me every class yeah. when I go up there because I go and train with him whenever I can because I just love the the warm up is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. If you can ever get a chance to do it, fellas, go up and see Marcus and, and uh, get there for the warm up. You get to train with the grandmaster, which is fantastic. The warm up will break you. It breaks everybody. And and I remember doing the warm up for the first time on Maui when I didn't know about it. And no one told anybody about it. It was just like, okay, time to warm up. And he just crushed the whole class with the warm up, right? And you know, and I was like, I was like, Professor, why do you go so hard on the warm up? And he said, he said in Rio we had a saying that the dog in the fight who has their tongue hanging out the side of their mouth first loses every time. He goes, you might not be the best, but you can be in the best shape. Wow. And he goes, if if you get tired, I don't care how good you are. You're going to, you're going to die in there. Hmm. And I was like, okay. And he goes, so that's what I do. I beat the weakness out of my classes so that they don't get tired. They'll get beat on points. So they get beat on maybe technique, but they will never get beat because they got tired. And I just, it's what a fantastic mentality. It's funny because you have to know if you don't know the technique to jiu-jitsu and you can't do it tired, then you really don't know it. 
So you Correct. have to be able to apply this when you're exhausted. And that was one of the yep. number one things that I learned actually from Frank Shamrock was that he was the guy that had kind of one of those warm ups. Your warm up was 200 squats, 200 push ups, 200 burpees, 200. And it was like, it was 200 of everything. Yeah. And then they had you, and then you, know, you had you go live, you know, for five rounds, whatever it was. And it was just, it was like, and it changed every here and there, but it was like, okay, that's your warm up and get exhausted. Yeah. And then you realize like your technique, none of that existed as you got tired. And as you right. got as you got in better shape, as you got right. your legs got stronger, your chest got strong, everything got stronger. The technique just seemed like it flowed a lot easier. So I understand exactly what you're talking about with your coach. This is this Mark, Marcus would say when the whole class, when the warm up was finally finished, and the whole class is just uh, just laying there dying. You know, he would just he would just say, "Hey, listen, I've been doing this a long time. I've been teaching people for fifty years. Anybody can fight fresh." You can fresh, you can show me every technique flawlessly, even to a res resisting opponent. But he goes, what about tired? And mm -hmm. by the way, how many times in the round, like how long are you really fresh? First half of the first round, maybe. And then you start getting tired. Yeah. And you got to operate tired. You've got to fight tired. And you've got to be good tired. And, and the, he, there's also a mental element when you start to get fatigued. You start Absolutely. to give up. You, you start to start to quit. A little early and no doubt. I, it's the worst. <laughs> well, I tell John all the time, we, we have this conversation about like old sayings, right? You know, um, you know, fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. It, mm. They stick around because they're true. You know, that saying stick around because you, we've seen it time and time again, not just yeah. in pro boxing and pro MMA. And it, we, we see it in all different types of sports. See it in, in football and basketball. You can see it in all the sports. As soon as your top players start getting or athletes start getting tired, Things start mm -hmm. to fall apart. They start blaming mm -hmm. other kids. They start blaming other mm -hmm. people for the actions. You should have been there. You should have done this. They start placing mm -hmm. the blame somewhere else. And mm -hmm. in, the, in the single sport, in an individual mm -hmm. sport, it's more difficult. You can't blame anybody else but yourself. Yeah. No, <laughs> you no, know? no. Yeah. But, it, but if, if I was Ben Rothwell's man, uh, if I was Ben Rothwell, I'd be blaming his manager as soon as I got out. How'd you book this damn fight against Kane? Well, his, his, manager was, <laughs> his manager was Monty Cox. And oh. I'm telling you the truth. His manager was Monty Cox, and Monty thought this is a this is a great fight for Ben. And I said, and I told him, I said, if Ben doesn't hit him with a huge shot the first time they engage, he's in trouble, Monty. I go, fucking Cain Velasquez is a goddamn cardio monster, yeah. and he goes, he'll never get him down. You watch. <laughs> and he had to get him down twenty times. Oh, Going to the deep water, man. Oh it's, my god, uh, it's brutal. But that's, that's what that's what um the thing that I get the most frustrated on the mats with is not when I fuck up a technique or I miss a sub or I get subbed or I, whatever, get tapped or whatever, that I don't give a fuck about any of that stuff. What really, really makes me nuts is when my engine runs out. Mm. When I get tired and I give up because I'm tired, if, if, ask anybody, I'll have an outburst on the mat when, <laughs> when I get tired and I get subbed because I was tired. I'm just, I'll like slam the mat with my hand and then all the other rolls stop and they, you know, it's yeah. like, and I'm just screaming, bah! Come, coming off tour really must be the most difficult time then, right? Because it's like, you know, you haven't probably been eating the best or the greatest on tour. Then you get back that first couple of what, three weeks, maybe a yeah. month is just torture. torture. Humility central is what it is. I wanted to ask you um, the difference between, what do you see the difference between the sport when like it was Chuck Liddell, Tito Ortiz, Jeremy Horn, and what you see now? I mean, it's come such a long way. And who, yeah. who, are, your, who are the people that you enjoy watching now? Yeah. Who do I enjoy watching now? Uh, there's there's a few of them. Um, I, I think well, there, there's different reasons, um, but I I think the moment that affected me the the deepest uh, in recent memory was when Luke Rockhold got retired mm -hmm. at, at his post fight interview. Oh, I think yeah. that that it's Paulo Costa. Uh, yes, it showed me a level of heart that I hadn't ever seen before. And, and, it, and it affected me in, in, in a very, very um, deep way. Like I, I really, I've, I, I, I've, I've shot with him actually. I've been out on, on the range shooting with, with Luke a couple of times and, and we've never really had a conversation just high, you know, whatever, yeah. and, you know, put the gear on and shoot. Um, I, I don't know him, um, but uh, that he's an was, ugly son of a bitch, isn't he? <laughs> oh, he's a dreamboat. Look at this guy. Oh, I mean, God, I hate. You look at him, you just go, not fair. 
Not yeah. fair at all. Maybe you guys you know look at him and think that. Oh, no, yeah. dude, Josh. You know. I was going to say, look at look at Josh here. I mean, clearly, yeah. life's not fair. Yeah. Yeah. You know how many times <laughs> Ralph Lauren is called fucking Josh? Yeah. <laughs> if I was 6'3", like Luke Rockle. As, as many times I'd as I'd have a number one album. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think I don't know. There's there's a few fighters now that I that I do really like to watch. Um, uh, 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 Kamzat uh, Chimaev is uh-huh. uh, one that um, I actually drove to Las Vegas to see that happen. Uh-huh. Uh, um, and, and, and that was on that really screwed up card where there was all those weight. You know, he missed weight, and then yeah. He, yeah. he got put in there with poor Kevin Holland and. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting in like the uh, second row and I watched that shit happen. It was oh, horrible. Like I just felt so bad because it, it was it was like if, a guy grappling with a grappling dummy. It was terrible. I'm, like, I'm telling you though, if you go and you watch that fight and you break down exactly what's occurring, it's an amazing accounting of how good Kamzad yeah. is no as question. far as understanding body positioning. Because no Kevin question. does a bunch of different, he does some Grammy roles, he does a lot of different things oh, in there to get himself, and it yeah. was like, just none of it worked. And you just dude's went, legit. my yeah. God, do you realize how good that guy is staying on someone, man? That it's incredible. was incredible, and I yeah. love to watch him fight. I don't know what's going to happen. It seems seems like he's he's sadly one of those ones that might be getting in his own way a little, uh, uh, emotionally or mentally, but uh, I, I hope that's not the case. Um, uh, I like... Um, Charles Oliveira a lot. Yeah, I really, I really like to watch him because I find he, he, he find him to be so durable and well rounded. Uh, and the part about Charles that I like the most is how many comebacks has Charles done? Where yeah. you see this guy and you're like, I can't believe they're not stopping the fight. Yeah. He's getting killed in there, and he fights it off, and he comes back and he chokes the guy. Like, I. That that Charles is 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 one of my favorites. I got so many favorites though, like I can't even tell you. <laughs> well, you know what makes right. what makes Charles remarkable is that you see the way he shows respect to all the other athletes and still goes out there and puts on a great performance. There's no ill will towards him. There's no trash talking. He believes in his skills. Yeah. Just I don't know. There's something about him that makes you want to like him. Yeah. Know, when he walks yeah. into the cage, as when he was the champion, walking into the cage, he gives he shakes all the corn the opposite corners hands. You know, shakes the fighter's hand, fist bumps, whatever they're they're willing to do. But man, he's got nothing but respect for everyone that he's ever yeah. faced. I Seems really, like a cool guy. Truly enjoy watching him fight. He's one of my all time favorite fighters, to be honest. And I've never said that before publicly, just because you know he's fought. He's ended up fighting some people that I know, and you know. But sure. uh, no, he's definitely one of my all time favorite fighters. Even when he was, I can at understand 14. why you guys wouldn't want to call out favorites too. It, it, it's, it's, it can't I, be I, difficult. I, I'm pretty hesitant to do it myself, just because there's, there's <laughs> yeah. so many people worthy uh, of praise. Yeah. You yep. know, that, that kid, Patty Pimblett. Oh my god! Like, what the hell is going on there? Like that guy's. He's something else. Well, he's, he's gonna be good. something else. I think. He's good, and it's the yeah. problem is a lot of people, you know. But it's it's what makes him is a lot of people want to see him get beat because he's got uh-huh. that cocky style. Uh-huh. It's a little, you know, it's definitely a different cocky style than than Connor, but it's there, you know. And he does all the weird, you know, motions and everything. But he's done it forever, <laughs> you know. Oh, I mean, I've, like, I've uh, watched he... him in Cage Warriors when he was doing it all. Oh yeah. There, there was a guy named Soren Bach who fought in Bellator, who is you know a really good wrestler as far as european and he you know he fought uh patty and just took patty down at will and just mauled him you know and it was like everyone was like oh he's not that good i go no he just went against a guy that's kind of habib like mm-hmm. in his ability to get people down he, got I go, he, he yeah. needs to he needs to learn how to stop that i go but you know yeah. he's good and then he went to the ufc and he's just done fantastic and you know yeah. It's funny we were so talking. Unassuming, like that. That's the part I love about this guy is he's so. Unassuming. He's unassuming. You, know, you, you look. <laughs> oh, at, the you look. look at a, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You see that guy walking down the street again. You know, like you see Vanderlei Silva. You, you think it's like, Ringo Starr? Yeah, he's got, you see Vanderlei. Got the like, Beatles okay, haircut. He's gonna kill everybody, and then you oh, yeah. see this Pimblet kid, and it's like he's just just another guy. He yeah. could be anybody, except the guy's a savage. Yeah. yeah, he's good. Totally he's I he's love watching him fight. I think he's really coming into his own. His confidence is becoming more key and more important to him. I'm, I mm-hmm. think as long as he stops ballooning up in between fights, getting so big, he's getting up to almost 200 pounds, 190. <laughs> in the weight. Yeah. It's okay. Can't do that he's for still long. Young. You can't do it for no. long. He's still young. Yeah. He's 27, 28 years old. Yeah. He can do it now. That will catch gets, you. Yeah, it'll eventually catch up to him. But to see the growth that he's had in the yeah. last two fights, 
He's looked yeah. fantastic, and I hope I, I hope he slow plays it too. There's no rush to get to the title. You know, right. he'll get there eventually. Yeah. But I yeah. think I, I agree with you. I think he is definitely an exceptional athlete, exceptional fighter. I'm looking forward. I would love to see, and I don't know how you feel about this, to see him and Connor fight. Oh, I mean, yeah. that would be probably the biggest fight because he's got so much hype around him, and then Connor yeah. obviously being Connor, and they're both kind of from the UK market. So it's not kind of they yeah. both are from the UK Let's market. Say, yeah, it's a yeah. Yeah. So I mean that <laughs> that, that would of. be a huge, huge fight. Connor has the US market as well, I guess you could say. Patty still needs yes. to grow into that, right? But I mean, back to my original question is, what have you noticed in terms of the the differences between oh. when the Chuck Liddell and the Tito Ortiz, and then now, how much? I mean, it's gotten so much bigger. I yeah, mean, it's huge. I, I think technicality has really has really come a long way. You know, I I think the technicality in fighting is is getting better. People with jujitsu is getting better. They're not getting caught in stuff as much yeah. uh, on the ground as they used to because now it's become a prerequisite. You've got to have some jujitsu because if you don't, it's just they're gonna find the hole in your jujitsu game and sub you. You know, yeah. and, and I think some of the uh, some of the strikers like um, Alex Pajeda is. I mean. Mm. But that's weird. Like that's not. I shouldn't even mention that guy's name in in this conversation because he's not in the same game. <laughs> yeah, he's know? just in a different level right now than everyone. He's just seems. in a different. He's in a different world. Like that's. It's. I, I I hope you know he doesn't read all his own press and believe it because that can break you you know and, and screw you up when you start uh, getting high in your own farts or whatever. But yeah. um, you know I I you know I hope he stays humble. It seems like it's working so far. But I just see it as a more technical game now where it's you if you go into this one dimensional like every once in a while you'll see an old old school jujitsu guy go in there and try to butt scoot his way through an MMA match and it's not good. It's no. not good. And I, I'm not going to name any names, but I think you know the fight I'm talking about. It yeah. just happened. A few months ago where a guy really decorated jujitsu guy got in there and he was like, okay, you're going to come to me. I'm going to butt scoot and get an ankle. Yeah. And, and he got his ass handed to him. And it, it, it happens you, know, a lot. It, you have to be rounded. You have to be. Yes. Yeah. You, you can't get away with the old days, you know, the UFC one, UFC five, UFC eight, you can't get around with butt scooting anymore. It was starting to dissipate then with the Mark Coleman era and the Mark Kerr era, you know, but it's really gone away from that. Now you need to be extremely well-rounded, not just in kickboxing, but as well as in jujitsu mm -hmm. and specifically mm -hmm. wrestling mm -hmm. to stuff the jujitsu guys and be able to get guys down from the feet. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the sport has definitely evolved. The UFC has definitely made some huge gains across the, across the world. You know, yeah. they're doing a lot of business right now over and overseas, over in uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, you know, Riyadh. Yeah. Um, did you did you have a chance to watch uh, Noche, the one inside yes. this year? I did. Yes. What were your thoughts? Um, <laughs> that was um, probably one of the better executed show business events I've ever seen. I, I was I wanted to go to it, but I couldn't get there. Yeah. Um, but to me, I just. I didn't really see a deficiency anywhere. Like I, I it, it just, it, it just worked, you know? And, and it was kind of the antithesis of the fight I went and saw with that Kevin Holland thing with mm -hmm. Shemaev. Mm -hmm. Um, I was talking to Dana halfway through the card and I was like, dude, you must need a hug right now. And I gave him a hug and I was like, bro. And he's like, yeah, this is the worst night of my life. I just want this to be fucking over, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, this is just a really hard day at work. Noche, I think was like the antithesis. It was like, he had to be high-fiving himself and everybody around him the whole night. Uh, what an amazing event. I, I, what are your thoughts? Josh, we were lucky enough to be able to continue our relationship with... OnlyFans. Now, OnlyFans started out as a basic way for people to be able to come together with people of knowledge in sports. Yeah, it went in different directions, but we're trying to bring them back to sports because sports is where it's at. We have so many people in the MMA world, the boxing world, the surfing world that are on OF, and you can be a fan of theirs. You can go to OF. If you don't want to see any of the girl stuff, you don't have to. It'll never come up in your feed. Only sports is what you want. Well, only sports is what you're going to get. That's true, man. Look, a lot of fighters have jumped, jumped on this bandwagon like we did when we first started working with OnlyFans. So when I started off with OnlyFans, we were the very first podcast that they've ever worked with. And then we led them into signing. Just say that great, again. Yeah, yes, we, we are the were. only podcast. The we were the first. first podcast that they ever worked with when they signed with us. So 
we uh, we uh, we've actually helped open up the doors for a lot of other top talented fighters to sign on the bandwagon. So with the OnlyFans, you've got Demetrius Johnson is on there, Luke Rockhold is on there, AJ McKee is on there, Chris Cyborg is on there. So many top athletes that are on there. Go ahead and check them out. Subscribe to them. Subscribe to us. It's fun for a little extra content. If you guys are looking for some more one-on-one connection uh, with your favorite fighters and with your favorite podcast over here, go ahead and hit us up over there. And uh, look, we're gonna you guys will have access, ask questions so we can answer them a little bit more, a little bit more one-on-one with us on that on that platform than you do get on, with us on YouTube. So go ahead and head over to OnlyFans, subscribe to our Wayne and channel over there. It is free. It is free. There will be some pro- some content that we will put over there that will cost. John and I are still working that out. But look, I know a lot of you guys ask questions about John's uh, refereeing seminar command. So I wanted to, where him and I are trying to figure out something out that we can do there. And also too, with me, a lot of you guys are hitting me up in my DMs. Hey, what about this in this technique in fighting? What about this in jujitsu? What about this in, in kickboxing? Why didn't the fighter do this? Well, if you guys want those kind of breakdowns, I'm going to go ahead and jump on a, on a video chat with you guys and do something over there. Or I can just go ahead and put it onto a video and place it up for you guys over there. And that's something that we can work on in terms of pay. So look, we're looking forward to continue our partnership with OnlyFans and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys over there. Subscribe to us over there at OnlyFans. I thought it was fantastic, John. I think we, it was, I think it was different for the people that were at home watching it versus the people inside the arena. So, um, like for me, I, I buy the pay-per-views like the day of, so it was $90. John mm-hmm. buys it two weeks before and it's like 65 bucks or something. cheaper. No, yeah. if you pre-order it, it's, it's cheaper. You get $10, oh. $15 off. Come on, yeah. man. So that, John, John's that. way ahead of the curve. That's of that a six pack of beer, baby. <laughs> I learned, you know, I, I, I've learned a thing from you guys. Another I think, one. I think what they did was, um, fantastic. They brought a lot of, um, different look and appeal to um, Mexican Independence Day. I thought was fantastic to represent their Mexican fighters. That's another mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this was well over, like uh, way overdue. Uh, they've I had agree. great champions. They've had great Mexican champions. Yeah. They've had great athletes. It was yeah. great to see them uh, all represented that night. So, and they fought their asses off, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. Great night of fights. I, I said, I, I look at it and I said, I go by, all the arenas that I've been to and, you know, the big time arenas and everything. And I always, I always put the, the Royal Albert hall in London, even mm-hmm. though it's not a huge arena, but it, it was the, it, it looked like the Roman call Roman days it looked like the Roman Coliseum yeah. with the red. And I always said that was the coolest venue I've ever done fights in. And I've done them too many. And I, I looked at that one and my son was there, he was working and I, and he was sending me, you know, things from it. And I go, I think the Royal Albert hall just got beat. Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, because I mean, think about this, and you know, it, you, it, when you're a fighter, especially you know, UFC, anything, you know, you go into all these arenas, you know, T-Mobile, all these different things, you know, but you go, you walk inside that cage, and you turn, and you see a sixty foot tall thing, of, live thing of you moving. You got to look and go, holy shit, look at that. That's pretty. <laughs> cool. It's like yeah. just things happening there that were. I don't care about all the costume changes and everything like that. That's but for the fighters, I think it was a unique thing. And so that way I look at it, I think it was a success. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, and, 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 you know, the other thing about it, you got to remember, is the level of risk uh, compared to a T-Mobile or, or, or something like that is extraordinary. Oh, to go yeah. into that room, you know, they don't just hand out nights in there. <laughs> it costs no. you a couple bucks to want to rent that room. And uh, you just better get it right. Yeah, um, and th- they they took they took a, a fantastic risk, uh, like the fight game in general. Really, you know, you you take all that risk, and sometimes you it's it's like fighting, I guess. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and 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 the 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 wins are you know the highs are high and the lows are crushing. You know, it, it's the same thing here. It could have been a disaster. You know, we they, like, we always say we always talk about fighters and trying to tell fighters, look, you know the road to being a successful fighter. I always say, if you have a 10 year career, you've done fantastic. You know, if you had longer than that, you know, Josh is someone right at 20 years. Okay. That's amazing when you think about it, but we always try to tell them it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, man. And you got to be smart about the way you go about doing things. It seems like it's no different with what, you know, bands go through because you see a lot of these bands come out and have this one big hit right away and they're hot and they're gone. Yeah. You guys yeah. have been around and you've gone through your hard times. I know. 
-hmm. but you guys have been around forever and you're still successful with it. How is it that you maintain that level and stay keeping it fresh? I, I think my, my opinion is that you, you just gotta, it's, it's not unlike the fight game guys. That's why I'm asking. You've got to ignore the noise. Um, avoid the distractions, uh, and, and focus on what you're doing and, and what you're there to do. You know, there, there, there's been, you know, many times in our career where, you know, I, I've had the conversation with, you know, with my guys, you know, at certain points where it's like, let's not forget what we're doing here. Like, let, let's not forget how we got here and why we got here and, and and don't get too distracted by whatever you know whatever bullshit it, you know it peripherally is going on and because if you take out the ball on anything you're going to lose it, it whether you're an investment broker or a fighter or in a rock band or whatever it is the instant you stop paying attention it will be the end it'll be the end of you so don't stop paying attention you, you, you can't or stop you know, just yeah. either do it or don't do it. But if you try to phone it in and coast it or, or, you know, the other thing that's, you know, a, a factor is if, if you try to do everything that, that can be a real, a real, um, not putting a hundred percent of your attention on what is the most important thing. N- no, it, it, that, that isn't what I mean, John. What okay, I mean is, me. is, is, is you, you reach a level of visibility and in music, when you reach a level of visibility, everybody wants you and everybody wants to work with you and everybody wants to collaborate with you. And yeah, hey, let's do this song. Hey, let's do this video. Hey, let's do this tour. Hey, everybody, everybody wants to get a piece of you. And you see it. A lot of artists do it where they just do everything. And I think that there's only so much thermal energy to an artist. And if it burns white hot, it burns up fast. And if you don't slow it down, and focus it and keep it metered and stay true to where, you know, where you came from and, and on what got you where you are. If you don't stay true to that and you get lost and, and you just, you catch yourself chasing trends because that's, let's face it, that's what songwriting is. Largely songwriting as a, a field uh, uh, or a vocation, you're always chasing trends of what is, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to fit into what's happening now, but what you really need to do is you need to cr- be creative in the way that's going to be popular in like six months, which yeah. is <laughs> obviously is very, very hard to do. Uh, a lot of that is, is luck uh, and, and lucky timing. And we've had some lucky timing. It, there, there's a saying that, you know, the, the one who has the right song at the right time wins. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that's really how it is because you, you can, look at what's in the music world right now and you look down the page and the charts, those songs could be number ones in a different climate, in a different setup at a different time. It's just about, is it the right time? Is it what people are looking for right now? But if you don't keep your eye on the ball, the whole thing will slip away from you. And, you know, there's that old, um, what is it? Is that old uh, Aesop's fable about the, about the fox with the, with the bottle of grapes and he reaches inside the, the slim neck of the bottle and he grabs the grapes and he can't get them out because he has all too many grapes. He can't get his arm out. That's, that's what happens to you in music. If, if you try to get everything at once, you're going to end up with nothing. You know, it's funny you bring that up because I, you know, um, I've been a big fan of Jelly Rolls for a while from before he was popular. I love and him. He's, he's a dear friend. He's, love Jelly he's awesome. awesome. He seems like a very awesome individual. He is. Um, I feel like he's being pulled in a bunch of different directions from the outside looking in. And I noticed he, he talks about staying focused, staying on what he's, what the goal is. The goal is to keep sharing positivity, you know, sharing his music, helping to try to make changes in people's lives. Cause he's already yeah. been there, done that. Um, man, I just, I, I want to continue to see his success, um, grow because he seems like such a, a down to earth person. What's your take on him and his, uh, his rise to the top so fast. Um, I, I love that guy. Um, <laughs> I, awesome. I, I, uh, 
I actually have all, I've, we've done a number of shows together. Okay. And, and I actually did get to pull him aside at, uh, I want to say it was stagecoach. We played stagecoach this last year. And, and I remember pulling him aside and kind of, you know, wrapping his head up and just going, Hey bro, like the only reason they hate you is because you're winning. So, you know, just yeah. don't worry about Cause it, it was starting to get to him at that time. Mm -hmm. The haters were coming after him and you know, he, they, they were fucking, it just happens when you're winning people want to, fuck you up and uh, but you know they were getting mad at him for losing weight and getting in better shape and you know like it, it, it doesn't matter and i was just like dude you just keep doing what you're doing don't worry about the haters because they're not going to help you you know no. you got to ask yourself when you read those comments on social media how many of these commenters have something that can help my end product how many of these people can i can take their advice from comments their sage <laughs> <laughs> fucking vision here for my career and I can make myself better. And the ultimate conclusion is always going to be none. Why yeah. am I reading this shit? You know, why am I listening to these assholes? And that, that was what I told him. I was just like, dude, good advice. Stop letting those people affect you. Don't yeah. listen to them. Don't do what they say. You just ignore it. So you're hey, saying we, I got to stop reading the comments. I tell them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a comment reader, baby. I love it. I go through them. I mean, okay. I always, I'm always trolling them though. I like to have fun okay, with them. You know, and, and that's a like sport in itself. I also want to, I also want to give the people that have something positive to say a thank you. And that's uh -huh. a big, that's a big thing for me. It's like, I go through with the people that do say great show. You know, I'm glad you guys did this interview. Those, cause we've been doing a lot more interviews this last three weeks. Uh -huh. And I want everyone to know they're like, man, we love these interviews. Great new format. We're digging it. I want those people to know that we're doing it for you guys. You know, we yeah. enjoy doing this. So it's fun. And yeah. um, I want to say thank you to those people that continue to support us in our show. That's cool. That, yeah. That, yeah. That's, a, that's a cool outlook, um, Josh. We, we, I, I just, I, I, I take good press the same way I take bad press. I, I don't give a shit. Yeah. I don't care yeah. what people think. I, I, I don't, you know. Go ahead and say it, Josh. Like it, that's go good. ahead and say <laughs> it. You said, go I, ahead and say it, Josh. John wants to say he's right, but I'll, I'll say that for <laughs> another day. He's very rarely right, but. Very rarely, but it's right there I am. And the word right is a matter of opinion. In this situation, he thinks he's right. I feel like going through the comments and saying positive <laughs> things to the people that are positive is a positive thing. So I feel like you know, I'm doing it's fun, counseling with you guys. It's, it's funny proud. because we did we did a clip on it was on and something that was happening. And I so I used jelly rolls, you know, yeah, I'm not okay, but it's all gonna be all right. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that was the way I started it, right? I said because mm -hmm. it was part of the thing with jelly roll, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, I get a thing from Jelly Roll. I got I got followed by the thing. I was like, "He's awesome." My my wife is like, "Jelly Roll is following you now." And I go, "You gotta be shitting me, right?" <laughs> yeah, it is like, it's, uh, he's he's, seen, a, he's a hell of he's a classic human being, you know. Wow. Um, the, been the, through the, a lot. And, the, you and these go, new country people, there's so many of them. Hardy is another one that's just like, yep. such a dear, sweet dude. That person, song he just, does with Lainey Wilson. Holy shit! That thing is phenomenal. He's awesome. I, I re, you know, he, 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 Ernest. There's so many of these guys um, that that we've met. That, they're just they're just wonderful people, and I just want them all to uh, more than being successful and and having successful careers. I I just want them to have happy. I want them to be happy. Yeah. You know, and and luckily they're seeing the forest through the trees. You know, um, a lot of them are realizing that. Um, there's a lot of this that isn't real, you know, a lot of this, that's just simply smoke and mirrors. And y if you let yourself get taken by that, it, it will, it will really disillusion you. And then one day, you know, it's like, um, who was it? Waylon Jennings, you know, you just get off the like 20 year bus ride and you're like, what the fuck happened? I don't have yeah. anything. You know, and I, and there's nobody here. I'm alone. Whoa. What, what happened? Yeah. You know, and, mm -hmm. and because you're, if you forget, you know, if you forget what's really important, yeah. your family, you know, for me, that's the most important thing is, is my family. So if, if I don't have them, I don't have anything, you know, yeah. it's, um, it, 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 the, all this other stuff would have been meaningless. And I'd rather have a failure of a career than, than jeopardize my family. The one last thing I want to get you out of here on this is there was a little thing that running around says that you were willing to take your pants off to prove how not serious you are. Yeah, I said that. What? what, what <laughs> can you can you explain to this? Uh, I guess people were saying that Nickelback was too serious. 
Yeah, well, there's always, I mean, there's been this problem that Nickelback's had, and I've only really kind of started to realize and understand it in, in the last five years or 10 years, is that we didn't ever really tell anybody our story. We've never really formed our own narrative. Uh, and as a result, I think you kind of, if you leave a vacuum there, it will be filled by what people think. Yeah. Frankly, what people think is usually bullshit. shit. Bullshit. So yeah, Let's like they're bullshit. gonna make up shit, and, and it's gonna, it's not gonna be real. And and it's you know. So what what I realized was it was kind of on us that a lot of people thought, holy shit, look at their pictures. There, no one's smiling, and oh, they're so important, and you know, blah blah blah. And we've been successful, and that's bad, you know. So um, uh, I, th I think that we left a vacuum, and we left a. a we left it up to other people to form a narrative about us mm -hmm. for us. And the documentary was very helpful because we got to tell our own story and, and, you know, um, form our own narrative about who we are and how we got here and, and what we're doing. And that, you know, Nickelback isn't just some monolith, uh, fucking, you know, like global bank that doesn't give a fuck about anybody. And we have hearts and feelings and, and it really sucks when people, yeah. you know, hurt you <laughs> it, it just it just does suck so there was this idea that all oh, nickelback you know they take themselves so seriously and somebody asked me that it was in canada and in, in toronto which i gotta tell you like coming from canada they're the most vicious in you know like i, I don't know if it's your home country or if it's just canada on canadians yeah. but they're horrible you know they're they're very very hard on us and and um uh, you know, the person would say, what do you think about, you know, the fact that people think that Nickelback takes himself too seriously? And to the dismay and shock of my band members, I said, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take my pants off and I'll just stand on this table in front of all of you right now just to show you how, number one, how I don't take myself seriously. And, and number two, I don't care what you think. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know, and, and besides, I have no shame. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a 52 year old guy. I, I, I got grown children. I've been married for 24 years. How much shame could I have left? Bingo. <laughs> yeah. Hey, this all right. Here, here's my last one. Cause I have been, I've been up in Canada too many times. I know Canada really pretty well. I've mm -hmm. been to nine of the 10 provinces I've been in. Mm. You're from Hannah, Alberta. Correct. Where is that? Because I don't know. I know from Lethbridge <laughs> up to Red Deer into Calgary. All I mean, we used to go to those places when we were looking for like um, good to times, do. Uh, like <laughs> make, like a McDonald's, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we didn't have that. It's um, if you if you were to be in Calgary and you start okay. driving straight east, pretty much. All right. Um, you'll you'll get to Hannah in probably an hour forty five if you're really pushing. So it's in the southern section of Alberta, then. Yeah, it's uh, uh, what you, uh we're like the Canadian uh, South Central. Yeah, sure. How how <laughs> far from? Because look at Lethbridge is not big. No, <laughs> okay. and Lethbridge is very close to the border, yeah. right? So how far from Lethbridge would it be? I think it's about three and a half hours drive, pretty much straight north of Lethbridge, if I'm not mistaken. Pretty close to that, anyway. Oh, man, uh, maybe, no way. You, you could be in Edmonton by then. You're halfway to Edmonton. Halfway to Edmonton. <laughs> so, it's like, so it's basically across from Red Deer? Pretty much straight east of Red Deer. Because yeah. it's Lethbridge, Calgary, Red Deer, Edmonton. Edmonton. Yeah, so we're See, pretty I much know straight Canada. east of Red, of, of Red Deer. It's like if you made it like a... I don't want to get too weird about it. But if you made like an isosceles triangle... Two of the points, uh, Calgary, Red Deer, Hannah would be the top point. Got it. Got All right. It. At least I know where it's from there. Hey, Mike, yeah. uh, Michael. Yeah. Go ahead. I want to say yes, uh, best of luck to your kids in music school. Yep. And uh, I want to wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much for your time, man. It's been a pleasure. I'm happy to be able to talk to you guys. I, you know, you. this is more than I've been able to talk to either one of you guys at any one time because you, you, every time I see you, you got the earpiece in or you're working or whatever. And, and uh, this is this is much better. Michael, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for your time. You're awesome. Congratulations on all the success you've had. I love what you told everyone about. Don't give a shit what the haters think. You and your brother and your band has been fantastic. Thank you for all the entertainment. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Michael Kroger. Thank you.